Hello, this is Zahil Alam. Welcome you all in Frankly Speaking. Our guest today is Lord Alderdice, a Northern Ireland politician and former Speaker of the Northern Irish Assembly, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Government of Northern Ireland, and current member of the House of Lords at Westminster in London, England. He is on a goodwill tour in Bangladesh to attend an orientation program uh, for the ninth Parliament members, which is jointly organized by Bangladeshi Shangshut and NDI. He is one of the participants uh, with President Bill Clinton and one of the signatories with Senator George Michel, uh, who is the Middle East envoy of President Obama of the Belfast Agreement. A uh, very special welcome on Frankly Speaking. Thank you very Not much. Not only this. Nice I think this is your first visit in Bangladesh. It is indeed, yes, and it's and, very nice to be here. Yeah, uh, we're uh, deeply privileged and uh, honored that you are joining with us today. And uh, I'm sure that this visit uh, must be uh, or aiming at to build bridges between your nations and between the two nations. And what is your uh, first impression about Bangladesh and what experiences you have so far gathered? Well, I suppose there are two sides to it. First of all, there's all the normal good relations because there are many people from Bangladesh who have come and settled in the United Kingdom and have families there, and it's always good to build those relationships. But also, I have a special interest because of my background in conflict and political disagreement, and I now spend a lot of my life in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, in places where people are trying to ensure that conflict is dealt with politically okay. rather than violently. And you have been working very hard in Bangladesh to open new chapters in your history, which are democratic political chapters. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here at this important time. But um, uh, yes, uh, you rightly mentioned, uh, and especially in Bangladesh, particularly in Bangladesh, that we have been a uh, long tradition of confrontational politics, mm -hmm. uh, politics of disagreement. Uh, non-friendliness and so how 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 to how to get rid of all all those confrontational political uh, uh, tradition and how to deal with this matter especially but taking into ex uh, ex from your experience I think what's very important is to understand that disagreement of itself is not a bad thing in politics. It's really quite important for people to be able to take different viewpoints and to debate those and to argue about them but to do so in a constructive way. One of the dangers can be that instead of our conflicts or our disagreements being able to be explored in words and in debates and in parliament, they're taken out onto the streets or they're explored in violence and expressed in violence. For many, many years that was the situation in my country. Indeed, one might argue for many centuries it was the case in Ireland. And, and of course, it always ended up in disaster. People kill, people injure, the economy destroyed, and so on. And eventually, this past generation of politicians decided to try to take ourselves forward. Not that we would agree in everything. We don't, we never will. It wouldn't even be appropriate that we did agree in everything. But that we would find a way of disagreeing in a civilized political fashion. And that's, I think, what we find ourselves beginning to do. And that's an important step forward. So, um, you have already joined the uh, uh, orientation program in Bangladesh, which is organized, I mentioned, that the Bangladesh Parliament and the National Democratic Institute of the United States. So, um, uh, what are the impressions, uh, what are the uh, experiences you have gathered so far, what you witnessed among our Parliament members? Well, I haven't had a chance to meet many of them. I've been able to meet some. I've been able to be at the Parliament itself and to observe uh, one of the sessions, to meet with the Chief Whip of the Government and the Opposition, the Speaker, and so on. Mm -hmm. And my impression is that people are hoping to be able to open a new chapter in parliamentary democracy and politics here in Bangladesh. Uh, you've had an election, very important election. Um, not a very easy outcome to the election because although uh, there are, is an overwhelming majority yes. of the governing party, that is not completely reflective of the number of votes that all of the parties got. Yeah, yes. And so that kind of outcome means there has to be a great deal of sensitivity and maturity on the part of all of the parties uh, if the parliament is to move forward in a constructive way. But I get the sense that both the prime minister and the leader of the opposition 
are uh, asking their followers, asking their MPs yeah. to try to behave in a constructive and respectful and parliamentary way. And I, I hope they will be successful in leading their colleagues in that direction. Is there any danger of having overwhelming majority in parliament? There's always a danger. Um, and in fact, when this has happened occasionally in, in Britain, the leaders have often found that it has been very difficult to manage. It's much easier to manage your, your party if you only have a small majority, okay. because everyone knows they have to be very disciplined. Yeah. They have to go along with the leader. If you've got a great big majority, then people, first of all, begin to realize that, well, the party isn't going to lose the vote no matter what happens, so they can afford to you know, not attend or be a bit disagreeable or even vote against the party sometimes. Also, if you've got a very, very large uh, parliamentary delegation, a lot of people who would have liked to be ministers aren't going to get a job as a minister because yeah. there aren't enough jobs to go around. Whereas if you've got a slightly smaller majority, then a larger percentage of your people will get ministerial jobs or chairmanships of committees or whatever. So although people might say, well, it's a very tough situation for the opposition, and that's true if, if you've got a small number of members, it's also not very easy to be managed for the government because mm. they've got almost too many members. Too many members. Yeah. Of course, for the opposition, it's also a challenge. It's, it's difficult to find ways of expressing your community's concerns, holding the government to account, and doing so in an effective way. And I, I'm sure this will be a challenging thing for the leadership on the opposition side. And it's been interesting just exploring a little bit of that uh, with some of them. In an in a overwhelming majority, do you think the, uh, definitely the opposition size is small? smaller. So how they can best seize the opportunity to uh, actively participate into the parliament session? I think it will also be important for them to have opportunities to be involved in the construction of the business and in making sure that they have some kind of role to play. And they may have to be a little bit imaginative as well. If you don't have the numbers, then you've got to find other ways of getting your message across and of, as we sometimes say in politics, getting to the high moral ground. In other words, not going for the lowest kind of politics, but going for a higher kind of politics uh, that concentrates on debate, on initiating things, on cooperation, uh, rather than on, on political conflict, where you're not going to win because you don't have the numbers. Yeah, that's true. But how effective is the uh, uh, Parliamentary Standing Committees are as uh, an oversight body? Well, they can be extremely effective. In fact, in terms of getting on with the actual business, most parliaments around the world that have parliamentary committees find that the best business takes place in the committees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and people can get on with building relationships with each other. Uh, but that does mean that opposition has to be represented in those committees because if it's only or almost only the governing party that's represented in the committees, mm -hmm. then of course it, it doesn't really work quite so well. So there, there are quite a lot of challenges. This big disparity of numbers of MPs against not such an enormous disparity in the number of votes that was cast. That's really quite a challenge. And I know that the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and, and other parliamentarians are aware that this is a challenge. And I think that's why they welcomed this orientation program uh, that uh, the Speaker and the Parliament have organised along with NDI. And I, I detect a good deal of enthusiasm. I'm looking forward very much uh, later on today to, to actually addressing them. Do you think the ministers should be included in the parliamentary standing committees? Well, usually in parliaments, ministers come to the committees and are questioned by them. So it's an opportunity to hold the ministers to account and to scrutinise the business. Now, there are some parliaments... He should be there. Be present, not be necessarily present. all the time. Okay. Sometimes it's quite good for the, the committee to be able to discuss things in the absence of the minister. Okay. But different parliaments construct this in different kinds of ways, and, and that depends on the politics of the, of the particular country and so on. But in most places, the ministers will attend but not be members of the committee, and they won't attend all the time. Uh, and when they do attend, uh, it can be a very interesting thing for that to be available to the press and to the public, maybe even on, on television, uh, where everyone can see the minister answering questions. That, that would be a very interesting development, perhaps, and one that's taking place in most parts of the world now. You know, uh, everybody uh, talking about changes, though, 
uh, including the Bangladesh is also, the mm -hmm. new government comes into power and they're also placed bound to uh, get a new change, new dimension, new, uh, new possibilities, uh, opening up new possibilities for the people. But uh, do you think the parliamentary democracy in a country like Bangladesh uh, 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 can really uh, help the people to get rid of the uh, poverty or the other, other developmental challenges? I think it can, but it's very important that it works in a constructive way. What do I mean? It's very important that the parliamentarians are enabled to relate with their constituents so that they can hear their concerns and represent their concerns. And so sometimes it may be useful to put some resources into that, making sure that MPs have constituency offices where they can meet with their constituents and okay. hear their concerns and so on. Then transmit them to, to the parliament. Then it's very important that the parliament itself is able to influence the government so that the government, which is a smaller number of people than the parliament, take concerns of the people in a very serious way. The third thing is, it's rather important to be able nowadays to cooperate internationally because many of these big problems, whether it's environmental problems, which are a serious threat to Bangladesh, whether it's problems of food or of energy or the, the current economic crisis, which I think probably hasn't yet affected Bangladesh so much, but probably will yeah. before too long. These are not merely domestic issues. They are domestic issues, uh, of course, but they, are, they have to be dealt with internationally. Now, governments are quite used to cooperating internationally, but parliaments are beginning to cooperate much more as well. And I think that that's an important, an important thing. And of course, we've got the media and new technology, which enables parliamentarians to get more and more clearly the views of their people represented to them. And some MPs are using the internet and Skype and mobile phones and so on to keep in touch with their constituents, to get what the people need and want and to try to make sure that it happens. Uh, Lord Alderdice, we need to take a short break. Uh, dear viewers, we'll be back right after the commercial. Stay with us, don't go away. You're watching Frankly Speaking. Dear viewers, welcome back. You're watching Frankly Speaking. Our guest is Lord Alderdice, the former Speaker of the Northern Irish Assembly. Uh, Lord Alderdice, you're talking about the uh, parliamentary democracy and how best it can deliver to the people. Um, what do you think that the parliament, what should be the ideal role of a parliament member? I mean, should it be uh, concretely related with the legislation or they should also be re uh, involved with the local or the constituency's uh, developmental problems or uh, if, uh, activities? Well, it's very important, I think, to understand what your constituents feel, what their concerns are, what their needs are. Now, you won't necessarily be able to fulfill all the wishes of your people, but you should try to understand their needs and convey that to other colleagues in Parliament and indeed to the government. And then when it's a possibility in a debate or in questions to, to ministers or, very importantly, in legislation, your approach, the way that you vote, is informed not just by what your party thinks but what your constituents think. And in the same way, it's important to take back the messages to the constituents to the and say, well, you know, we passed this law or we asked the Prime Minister to do this or we tried to press the case for this because we feel this is the best way of attending to your needs. So it's a, it's a two-way flow okay. and it's a very important It's a building bridges. Flow. It's a building bridges, it's helping people to understand and it's helping the people to be involved in their own governance, which is really what the purpose of the exercise is. You know, corruption is a big problem in the third world countries. So how effectively they can, they, they can perform or they can accountable the civil administrations, I mean the parliament members or the parliament itself? It's a, it's a very serious problem in many parts of the world. And it's a very dangerous problem because once people have the feeling that their representatives are not people of integrity, that they're really only in it for themselves and for their own benefit, 
then that poisons the whole possibility for, for good governance and for people's confidence in their parliament and, the, and in their government. And there are a number of different ways, that, of course, that one can try to deal with that. One can try to insist, for example, that parliamentarians declare all their interests in a register. Uh, that this is supervised by an independent person from outside who's mandated to, to uh, supervise these things. Uh, that when there are breaches that they are taken very seriously and they're properly dealt with by the parliamentary authorities and governmental authorities. And that there are various ways in which people are put under proper scrutiny. It's also important, I have to say, that parliamentarians are provided with the proper resources to do their job so that there is no excuse for them mm -hmm. to try to seek resources or funding from any other kind of source. In I mean, the what, end, what, what kind of resources? I mean, uh, in your experience, so what are the resources you are providing to the parliament members? Well, for example, in, in uh, both in the Northern Ireland Assembly, where I served, and also in Westminster, uh, MPs have a, a reasonable salary. It's not enormous, but it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. They have expenses to ensure that they can travel backwards and forwards to their constituency and on yeah. business. But they also have offices in their constituencies, at least one, okay. which is paid for by the parliament, mm -hmm. and staff who are able to do the work both in the constituency in and parliament. in the parliament. Okay. So they got proper resources to do their job. It's not lavish, but it's proper and it's properly accounted for and properly supervised. And even in Britain, there's a constant supervision. Okay. And public concern. Is there any 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 fund allocation for for uh, taking care of development activities in their own constituency? Usually not f supervision directly of of funds of that kind. That's okay. something that is usually done by local government, okay, or indeed by government departments. And the job of the MP is not to get involved in distributing money, mm -hmm. but in holding the government to account okay. for its distribution mm -hmm. of of resources. If you give MPs the opportunity of distributing funds and, and money, mm -hmm. then that tends to mean you get patronage and that quickly leads into a degree of corruption and, and so on. So that's a dangerous road down which you, you to go. But you can give them proper resources to run proper services to represent their constituents and hold the government to account. And I think if you don't do that, they can't do their job properly. And uh, that means that people get disenchanted with them. Yeah, Lord, there has been a huge uh, anxiety, panic, uh, uh, discussions relating to the issues of the global matters like the uh, economic recession, climate change, uh, food security, yeah. uh, and, and many other issues related with it. A country like Bangladesh particularly, we have, we have all these problems yeah. uh, and uh, the fallout is uh, already started affecting Bangladesh's. Uh, though the uh, scale or intensity is low right this moment. But uh, what should be the role of the parliament, I mean the parliament session or parliament members to uh, dedicate their time slots discussing uh, the local issues or the major development issues? What should be the ideal form of uh, debate or discussions in the parliament? What should be their attention? Of course they have very specific and local and domestic responsibilities and that's the main set of responsibilities. When it comes to dealing with these bigger issues, however, like the economy, inward investment, the environment, things which are not just domestic but are affected by the wider world, our experience was that if the parties tried to continue their party struggle with each other over these issues, then the community didn't benefit. If we wanted to get inward investment, if we wanted economic progress, if we wanted to address environmental issues, the parties actually had to work together. And so we got parties that you know, fought each other very strongly in th at the elections. Nevertheless, after that, they had to come together and, for example, go to the United States, the leaders of the opposing parties, together. Had to go to Europe together to address these bigger issues because these are issues that are bigger than party politics, they're bigger than even one country. And if we simply squabble with each other, our experience was we lose out. Uh, and these are dangerous times, let's be very clear about it. We, we all know that when the economic situation gets really bad, and in the West it is getting really very seriously bad, mm -hmm. then that's not just a problem for the economy, it means the environment isn't properly attended to. It means political instability arises. It can even mean wars occurring in various parts of the world. So these are very serious times, and they're much too serious in a way for inter party strife. People have to work together for the sake of the country as a whole. 
you have resolved uh, many critical issues through uh, discussions mm. and through uh, agreement. But uh, in our country, uh, it's a, it's a uh, just uh, no denying that we have that our parties have been fighting each other, and sure. the uh, often it goes uh, uh, to the street violence. And sure. but uh, uh, recently, uh, to an election, we've have formed uh, parliament, yes. and the parties uh, already uh, started sitting together, debating issues, uh, and you have already witnessed some of them. Yeah. So how how optimistic you are about the practice of the uh, uh, holding the tradition of democrat uh, democracy in a country like Bangladesh? I think this is a great challenge for the current generation of politicians. I do get a sense that people realize that things have not been as good in the past as they might have been and as they should have been, and I think they want to make a change. In our experience, there's a very clear relationship between conflict and violence outside on the streets and parliamentary engagement. If you got more parliamentary engagement, if you got politicians working together, you got less trouble outside on the streets. On the other hand, if they didn't work together, if they started to fight in an inappropriate way, I don't mean discuss and debate, but if they actually got into some kind of conflict with each other in the parliament, then you got more trouble out on the streets. And th there's no getting away from this relationship. It's absolutely clearly there. So it's a huge responsibility on parliamentarians to move forward. I think that they understand that. I think they want to do it. But it's a big challenge because it hasn't been like that all the time in the past. And if there are ways that those of us from outside who have had to struggle with these very same questions ourselves, there's any ways that we can be helpful or supportive or whatever. I know that people, not just in, in Ireland, North and South, but in many other parts of the world, desperately wish the people and politicians and government of Bangladesh well in this big challenge that they have in the new parliament and with the new government. Uh, we are almost uh, end of our program. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Lord, uh, that when the question of Bangladesh comes into international arena, it always conjures up with some negative images, like it's a land of flood, corruption, and so and so. So, uh, w what did you visit uh, uh, have uh, in any way changed that sort of uh, negative uh, impressions or images uh, after visiting this country? Well. For me, of course, I, I don't only know about the troubles in Bangladesh. We have many people from Bangladesh visiting and living in the UK. And I think what impresses me is about the energy of the people here, the enthusiasm, the great resource of people, and also the sense that politicians who've just been elected do want to see things moving forward in a better way. I think that's a very positive thing. It's a challenging thing. It won't happen without a lot of work and commitment. And you in the media, with all your technology and all your new ways of working, you too will play your role in this. And I've been quite struck by the developments in the media here with mobile technology and television stations and so on. A lot is, a lot is happening in Bangladesh. A lot of possibilities are, are coming forward in Bangladesh. That's a lot of responsibility for people, politicians, and even the press, and I wish you all well. Thank you very much, Lord Alderdice, for joining us on Frankfurt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dear viewers, Lord Alderdice uh, uh, has been acclaimed for his very distinguished service to the Northern Ireland Assembly and for the skill and commitment he had delivered to the nation. Suddenly, Bangladesh's newly formed parliament and elected members of parliament or Jati Shangshad will immensely benefit at listening to him. Uh, what a matter of fact, uh, we are cautiously and optimistically looking at this parliament and we are eager to see what it can really deliver for the welfare of the team in millions. We thank you for watching this program and we invite you to watch our next episode. Until then, do take care and welcome.